You may be seated. So thankful for my leaders in the church. I'm truly thankful for you guys, my family. When God made the earth, it was dark, it was void. And then he said, let there be light, and there was light. In John, it's, it starts off by saying that the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness couldn't hold it back or comprehended it not. And in verse 14, it says, and we beheld his glory, which is that light. And we beheld him. And I just want to encourage you right now that because of your response through the trials, through the pain, through what you're going through, it's like when I was just, it's crazy because when I'm just standing here and seeing the response, I feel God's love. Just seeing when he sees you cry, when he sees you broken, when he sees you worship, when he sees you praise, even though there's so many things that are going on in your life. And I just begin to cry because it's God's love through me. Because God is saying, it's so amazing that when you have nothing left, when you're going through a tough time, when you got nothing left, that you begin to praise me and worship me. That's just as incense to me, just as the woman at the alabaster box who broke and gave everything that she had. And lately, it seems like God has been taking one thing at a time from me, little by little, and more and more. And God has been pulling things out of me and saying, Chris, will you give this up? Here you go. And I'm like, yes, okay. And we could look at it, we could look at it so negative and to be like, wow, God, it hurts. It's tough. And God has told me lately, he's like, Chris, I love you unconditionally. That while you were yet sinning, I was patient for you. And that I came to be that love and I died on the cross for you and I gave myself for you. And he said, Chris, can you have that unconditional love towards me that no matter through the storm? And I was just like, wow, I've never heard that. Can you have that unconditional love that no matter what conditions that go on through your, through your life, that you love me, that you will worship me, that you will praise me, that no matter what's going on, that you could be right up front right here and just jumping up and down. Because no one has to know what's going on, but I know, and I see everything that's going on in your life. Second Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, this is Paul speaking of. He was saying that, you know, God has showed me a lot of things and revelations and things like that. And I could talk all about that. I could tell you the things that God has told me and the things that God has showed me. But he was saying, but that can give credit to me. I don't want any credit to me. But he was saying right here that three times I begged the Lord to take it away. He was talking about the thorn in his flesh. And each time he said, this is God, he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I can tell you right now, church, I could tell you as a witness that when I was broke, I felt his peace. I felt the most peace I've ever felt. Even right now where I'm mad, I have nothing. But I'm telling you, I've never felt more peace than how much money I've ever had in my life. I'm telling you right now that when I was alone, when I was left alone and abandoned, I felt his love the greatest. When I was broken, I felt his hand on the potter wheel begin to shape me and mold me. I'm telling you guys, when I was lost, I was found. When I had nothing to turn to you were there I'm telling you when I lost all hope when I lost everything that I've ever had in my life when I have nothing I can tell you that I have everything right now even though God has been stripping me and taking everything out of my life I have everything (laughs) 
So I can tell you, church, as a response to speak what God is telling the church right now, because of your response towards me, because of your praise and worship towards me, because you decided to take a stand, and because you decided to jump up and just worship me, I am revealing my glory to this world. But it first starts with you. As I'm beginning to remove these stuff out of your life, what I'm doing is removing that flesh so that I can reveal my glory through you. So when you see me, you do not see this flesh. You cannot take any credit for me. But when you see me, you see God's glory. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. That's all I have. Thank you, God. Praise God. Thank you for all that came on Friday night. We had a bunch of area churches that were that sent some Spanish-speaking people. We had a powerful move of God. Thank you for encouraging that. Um, lastly, before I bring him to the pulpit, is uh, I was just thinking of this worship and, and what happened. Worship really is a message. If you'll think about it, worship is a message. We tell him just how awesome and wonderful and powerful and compassionate and merciful and patient he is through our worship. That causes him to be drawn close to us. And when he comes close, he begins to speak to us. And when he speaks to us, we respond to him. Sounds like a message to me. We want him to come close. So when we worship, he just began to speak. And this young man just interacted with him, receives the Holy Ghost, born again of spirit. I mean, during a worship song. It doesn't get any better than that. It, does, it doesn't matter how professional you get. It doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't get any better than that. When you worship and somebody receives the Holy Ghost, we've, we've gotten there. God is pleased with it, and so am I. I appreciate that. So we have uh, Brother Scott with us, such a friend of the family, friend of this church, powerful man of God. And, you know, I know a lot of people don't like saying it, but he really was an apostle to Ecuador. He was an apostle to Ecuador. <clears throat> and the Bible says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So we honor the position that God has given him. Um, there's, there is nothing about him that would ever doubt what God is doing through him. But even more than that, greater than that, my goodness, he is a friend of God. If you ever were able to go out to breakfast or lunch with him and just, I always have him pray over our meal because it's as if Jesus is sitting across the table and he's talking to him and there are things that he says to him. I remember the first time he did it, we had six or seven ministry people in our church sitting in a restaurant and he began to thank the Lord for the food and all seven of us were just crying, weeping at the table. And I'm thinking, seriously, there's something going on with this man. This man is a friend of God. And if you'll trust him just for the next few minute, moments and allow him to share with you what Jesus has told him to tell us, your life will be forever affected. Amen. Could we thank the Lord for what he's done in Brother Scott's life? <clears throat> Before you're seated, I would like to tell you something that I feel like the Lord spoke to me just a few moments ago about. All of you that know me know that I cannot hear. It's one of the thorns in the flesh. It does not affect my faith for what God can do. It's just something that God has allowed to happen to me. So if I'm going to repeat anything that someone has already said in this, it will only be a confirmation of what God wants to say this morning. 
I looked at you early as you were in prayer, even before you began to rejoice. And I turned to Brother Baye and I said, this is the kind of congregation that God rejoices within. I want you to know, and perhaps there are those here that may not understand what is happening when people meet together. But let me share with you that the church is not a place of entertainment. The church is a place where believers come together to renew the energy of their spirit in order to go out and become the ambassadors that God has appointed. You are not one entity. Even though you are a congregation, you are not an entity. Each of you in the eyes of God is an individual. And he looks upon this congregation today. Each of you are focused in God's eyes and God wants you to be ministered to this very moment. I was on my way to Texas in order to preach the Easter services for one of our churches. I was on an American Airlines flight. It was packed and jammed. I began to contemplate something about God and I began to think about him asking him to prosper my way as far as the ministry is would be concerned that I would meet there suddenly I felt like that I was alone with God there was not another person in that plane but me and suddenly I realized that I had lost contact with every individual there and realized that I was singing with a loud voice. I was singing, oh, how I love him. How I adore him. My breath, my sunshine, my all in all, the great Creator became my Savior, and all of God's fullness dwelleth in Him. When I realized I was singing with a loud voice, I didn't look around to see if somebody thought I was silly. But this is the way that many of us need to understand that even though we're here in a congregation, we're alone with God. Yes. And the reason that we're alone with God is because God loves us individually. I know I'm having you to stand here for a moment. And I'm not going to be long when I speak because my ministry has already been consummated as far as my visit has come to be here. I want to repeat what I told your pastor. I said I contacted something on my return trip from Texas, and I began to have a terrible coughing spell and I was in prayer, and suddenly I raised to my feet, and I was headed for the telephone to tell Brother Betcher, Pastor, I can't make it this time. Not because I was sick, but because I felt like that maybe something would, might be contagious, and the Lord stopped me.
He said, I've got a job I want you to do while you're there. I have accomplished that job. Nobody needs to say what I have done because God understands that I ministered in a way that I felt like that I should. Let me say this before you're seated also. High in the Alps, there are two lakes. From the air, it looks like a single lake. But there is a small stretch of land that separates the two lakes. And the, and the running off of those lakes, when they go down the mountains, they separate to the point that when they reach their source of refilling the other resources of water, they are hundreds of miles apart, even though in the mountains it appears as though they're only one lake. What I feel like that God would have me to say to you at this moment, if there's any of you that are in this building, you feel like that you're a part of this congregation, even if you're a visitor. Please don't let that stretch of land of doubt separate you from the distance that you will travel and the source and the result of being miles away from the will and the purpose of Almighty God. Surrender your life. Rindasi. Lavova. Entonces ahora, aunque hay en personas aquí en una, persona, una posibilidad que no entienden lo que está sucediendo aquí, siente un poco que la gloria de Dios puede llenar la vida. Amén. Pueden sentarse. I don't feel like I'm going to have to be long today to carry the message that I feel like that God has given because I have already given the introduction of what I feel anointed to say today. I want to thank my pastor friend for inviting me to be in a church congregation that I love to assist in. I love this church individually. I don't look at you as a congregation. I look at you as individuals and each of you as a friend. That way I can minister to you. So let me, ex let me express my thanksgiving to the ministerial staff here that for a moment I can be a part of you. And for a moment I can be a part of you. I'm going to be speaking today from a verse of scripture that the few words that are contained in that scripture is the encapsulated gospel. Complete. Complete. I may be confused between Spanish and English today. So I believe I can do either or, the, or, or, or even both. But the words that I'm going to speak, children have grown up in Sunday school and learned the words of this scripture by memory. It is one of the most beloved scriptures of the entire Bible. And the moment that I begin to quote that scripture, you're going to smile and say, yeah, I know that scripture. And I believe in it. 
Children learn it by memory. It may be one of the first that you committed to memory. And it goes something like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but come to everlasting life. When you underline that with the following scripture, it may make a little confusion come up into your mind. But it said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. I want you to notice two words that I've sort of italicized in my speech. That you, everyone that believeth him in him should not perish. That means that God has given the gospel of salvation that anyone in the entire world can accept it. You should not be lost. You should be saved. You can be saved. And then when the scripture underlines that one in the verse that follows, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might so I'm telling you today that it is not an assurance merely because you're a part of this congregation that you're going to be saved. You're going to have to embrace that gospel in the encapsulated part and say, I want that, I desire that, and I surrender to that. Sometimes there are individuals that might be confused with John's writing. When he said, for God so loved the world, he was not using the world as one entity, as I mentioned to you in the beginning. God looks at you as an individual. God so loved the world. What does that mean? Because John wrote in another place, love not the world. For all that's in the world. And he begins to talk about the activities that are in the world. So what is God saying in this scripture? For God so loved the world. Then John speaking and said, love not the world. God in those two scriptures are separating the sinner from the activity. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Does that make sense to you? So when we say that love not the world... It means that you and I, who have freely received the grace of God, we cannot condemn a sinner for sinning in the, in the same measure that we had sinned. For the scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we have received freely. His grace. And that grace has covered our sins. And he said in a promise that he would cast your sins into the depths of the sea and remember them no more. Then there's another scripture that makes sense to me. 
He says that he separates your sins as far as the east is from the west. I asked a brother one time, I said, why didn't he say north and south? Why did he use east and west? Because if you traveled 5,000 years toward the east, you would never come to the west. You're going to continue to go east. If you went west, you'd never come to the east. <coughs> Pardon me. That's the reason that God says that he will cast your seas, your sins as separated as far as the east is from the west. And God remembers those sins no more. It has a sort of a, an apparent and seemingly conflict, but it's not. God looks at each of you as an individual. You are alone in this place with God. I wouldn't be surprised if suddenly while I'm talking, you feel like you're the only person sitting in this place by yourself. But when you do, or while I'm speaking, I want you to repeat the words, for God so loved me. Not the world, because that's the entity. But God so loves me that he gave his only begotten son that was hanged on Calvary bled and died in order to pay the penalty of your sin and all you've got to do to rid yourself of that sin is to surrender your life to God and repent of those sins and God will take those sins that you have committed no matter how deeply you were involved and cast it into a separation as far removed as the east is from the west. And if you try to repent of that sin again, I can imagine God's sin. What sin? So let me talk to you for a short while about God loving the sinner, but having a distaste of the sinner's obvious activities. And I'm, I'm encouraging each of you, Spanish, English, or whatever culture, whatever language, God speaks them all. I talked to the Spanish the other day, Friday night, and I said, only in the church. Can the cultures of the world live together in perfect harmony? Does it make any difference if you speak Spanish, German, Chinese, whatever, English, Spanish? God understands it all. But we become, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we become one. We become a family, integrated together by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So those are my introduction today. So let me talk to you about the difference between God loving the sinner and hating or having a distaste for the activities. Paul teaches us that this is the thread of truth woven into the fabric of salvation. It becomes what God intends 
people to be. He looks at the sinner, not the way he is, not the way she is, but he looks at the sinner in what they can become. I can imagine a father of a son, just like you and your son. I can imagine this. He wants his son to exceed and to excel. But while that child is growing up, he's not that. But he wants him to be that. And he assists him, encourages him, teaches him the steps in order to climb to the higher levels and to excel in the world today. So Paul teaches us that the threads of faith and confidence and grace are those that form the picture of what God wants each of you to be. I'm not talking to a congregation today. I'm talking to you as an individual. Is that all right? Okay, so I'm there. As you look into the life of Christ, this is proven without doubt time and time again. I remember very carefully when Jesus and the disciples were on their way to Galilee and the Bible says they must needs go through Samaria. Why did they need to go through Samaria? It's because nobody else went that way. There was a separation between the Samaritans and the Jews to the point that the Jews would go way around in order to travel, escaping the confines of Samaria. But Jesus had to go. And when he, what, when he went there, he sat down on the well. Suddenly there was a woman, because the disciples had gone into the cities to buy fiddles to eat, Jesus was wearied with his journey, so he was sitting there. Maybe the disciples really didn't understand, but Jesus had a ministry that he was going to, he was going to present to a woman that needed him. She came with her pitcher and was going to take water from the well. How do you introduce yourself to someone without a conversation? So Jesus said, would you give me to drink? In order to open the doors of conversation, and here she repeats what I have already told you. Why is it that you are asking of me a drink and I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew and we don't have any dealings between each other? Right. I'm not going to go through the whole scenario, but Jesus was telling her, I am the door to a relationship. And so he begins to talk to her and he removes the wall of culture between the two. Slowly and intricately, he begins to move the stones that separated. And the first thing that you know, he had spoken to her in a way that she felt condemned. She was a sinner. And here Jesus is loving her. He's talking to her. And he said, why don't you call your husband? She suddenly was 
even beyond amazement. I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, I know. Even the man, you've already had husbands. And the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. Now, what has happened here? Jesus Christ is separating the love for the woman from the sins that she is committing. And she realized that, that it was the love of God that was reaching out to her to embrace her with a hope that goes beyond the life that she had been expecting. And that's what he does with each of us. For just a moment, let me ask you a question. What sins were you involved in? What were your activities when you lived without hope in the world? Before you came to an altar of repentance, what were your activities? Then if that be the case, when another walks into this building... You cannot condemn the person because you were centered at one time, but that God rendered to you the grace of God that was able to remove the sin from your life. And God loved the woman and had this taste for the sin. She caught the message and accepted the message, and Jesus Christ had to stay there and preach to the world of Samaria because of the woman's testimony. Does that make sense to tell you that Jesus loves the person no matter how far deeply in sin they have become involved you can have been such an ugly sinner that the world has disgust when they see you. But if you would just stop long enough, you could feel the genuine love of Jesus Christ for you. I call that wonderful news. I was preaching in a place one time. Somebody walked through the door and the Lord spoke to me. That individual is searching for one thread that she could hang on to, contemplating suicide. Life's no longer worth living. Okay, let me paraphrase a little bit. You never know who walks through those doors. You don't know the depths of discouragement. You don't know the heart that is broken. You don't know what they're suffering and that's why the church needs to surround them with love and concern regardless. Even if you know the sins that they are involved in, they are the person that I can share this for God so loved that he did not condemn the sinner, but had he loved the sinner to bring them into a loving relationship with God. So, that's going to be the nutshell of my message here. Do you remember the love poem that Elizabeth Browning wrote? How much do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love you to the breadth and the depth and the breadth of my soul. 
That's the way Jesus is expressing his love this morning. I feel that same love for each of you here this morning. And I want to be able to communicate that Jesus Christ loves you with an inexhaustible love. Inagotable el amor de Jesucristo. For you that don't know Spanish, inagotable means inexhaustible. Okay. Throughout the Gospels that reveal the life of Jesus Christ, you find the compassion of Jesus Christ for those that he comes in contact with. Let's talk about the religious leaders that brought a woman, dragging her into the presence of Jesus Christ. Their announcement was, was, their announcement was one of arrogance. We found this woman taken in the very act of adultery. And the scripture says, such shall be stoned, worthy of death. And the law condemned her to that type of end. And when Jesus heard those words, if you read the scripture again, he didn't respond. He knelt on the ground. Only eternity will tell us what he wrote. I'll give you my opinion. He wrote the sins in the ground and in the sand of each of those that were making accusation. You may not have committed adultery, but there were sins in your life that kept you from the glory of God. So we don't condemn. We love. We are the entity of God in extending our arms of love and concern. It's very important to say that God wants us to reach out as representatives of the kingdom. I admire the tears. You saw me come, Brother Bob, you saw me come to the edge and begin to scan over the people. I didn't count you, but I found out by looking that the majority of you were with tears running down your cheeks. Aren't you happy for a pastor that encourages this kind of activity? I'm going to say something, but I'm not condemning other churches, you've got to understand, unless they are guilty. But churches in this day and time have damaged the faith of so many because they are a business instead of being a church. Their pastors are businessmen that are able to administrate a fantastic group of people and make it succeed. But I talked to this man this week that I've been here, and I've told him, Brother Betcher, you're a shepherd. You're not an administrator. Why, why do I say that? I say that because your tears constitute a stairwell that you can climb to the higher levels of spiritual life and value. It's in that spiritual life that we saw here this morning that 
sick are healed. Miracles are taking place. Sinners are repenting. So I said that to say this. One time, I mentioned this to the Spanish, Brother Rodriguez, the other night, so I'm not just repenting. I'm ministering to this congregation. I was in my home, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Son, I want you to go down to Tom's supermarket. I didn't need to buy bread. I didn't have any need to buy milk or anything. And with a little thought on my lips of saying why, I recalled that the Lord said, Son, I want you to go down to Tom's supermarket. That was all he said. Even though I did not need to go to Tom's, I walked the short distance to Tom's supermarket and I did not see nor understand why God had directed me there. I went up and down the aisles as though I was looking for something to cover up my activity. <laughs> and after a few minutes, I heard my name. I looked around and there was a woman that I had never met. She knew me. I did not know her. After that encounter, I have never met her again. I don't know who she is. I don't have a name. All I have is that, son, go down to Tom's supermarket. She spoke to me and she said, Brother Scott, my son is in the hospital with an inoperable heart valve and the doctors are not given any hope of, her, of his survival. They feel that he could go at any moment and I wonder if you would pray for him. How can you doubt God saying, go to Tom's supermarket when suddenly there's a ministry that's opening to you? So I held out my hands like this. And she spoke and took a step backward and she said, you mean here in the supermarket? <laughs> and I looked, her with, looked at her with a reprimand and I said, sister, you asked me to pray for him. Do you want me to pray for him alone? Don't you have compassion for your son and need to pray with, um, with me for him? So she put her hands in mine, and there in Tom's supermarket, I prayed that God, in his wisdom, would lay his hand upon that son and I said goodbye to the woman, and I went back to the home. Four days later, she called, and she said, Brother Scott, they're discharging my son today. They cannot, can no longer find the reason. But let me assure you, that it's in services like this where the tears are flowing and we are surrendered to God, that is where God can minister through us to individuals. Let me ask you to do something. I know I'm just hitting and missing this morning, but I'm, I'm telling you what God wants of us because he loves you so much each of you, look at your hands. Each of you, look at your hands. Those are the only hands that Jesus Christ has right now. And do you know that what we become, we become the embodiment of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He had come 
into the world to reconcile the world unto God. We are the only hands that can stretch out to the sinner. We are the only hands to a man that's suffering with deep cancer situation and lay our hands and let the Spirit of God move as a conduit through our hands and minister to that man or that woman. The man that was without hope what if I had said, Lord, I don't really need anything from the supermarket. And I had not gone. Well, I better rephrase that a little bit. God might have sent somebody else. But God has selected me to go there and to pray the prayer of faith. I also talked to the Spanish the other night. I was visiting in the church of a district superintendent. And during the worship service, one of the sisters just fell flat on the floor. In that congregation, there were a number of, of nurses. And they came and they tried to find a pulse. And they looked at the pastor and said, Pastor, she's dead. There is no pulse. So they called the paramedics. We went to pray for the woman. Nothing happened at that moment. When the, now, you've got to remember that I'm talking about moments that it took the paramedics to come to that place. How many minutes, I don't remember. But I spoke to the superintendent, and I said, I'll tell you what let's do. Before the paramedics take this woman that has been pronounced dead by the nurses, allow them to check her pulse and ask them to give us another moment to pray. And when the paramedics had taken the pulse, in all their expertise, they looked at the pastor and said, she's gone, she's dead. There is no pulse. And the pastor said to them, give us another moment. It won't matter. She's gone. So we put our hands on that individual inert in the floor. And we prayed the prayer of faith. God, you are the giver of life. You are the resurrection and the life. And all at once, the woman opened her eyes and said, what am I doing here lying in the floor? <laughs> what am I saying to you? I'm saying that each of us have that power that's resident in our life. And if we will allow these hands to be surrendered to God, God will use these arms to become conduits of his Holy Spirit and power. Yes. Okay, not long ago, most of you know that I teach in the Urshan Graduate School. I don't know why they want a 92-year-old preaching teaching there. <laughs> but Brother Norris the professor there of that class. He and I were double teaming. He taught for a while, and I taught for a while, and I taught about the hands, just like I just got through talking to you. If the power is, res is resident in that heart, right, right. all you've got to do is let it flow. I told Brother Norris, I said, Brother Norris, I feel like there's somebody here that has a chronic situation in their life and that God wants us to pray for them. I don't generally do that from the pulpit. 
but I did that day, and I said, if there's an individual here that has a chronic situation that you need delivered from, God has told me that you need to come and let us pray for you. A young girl rose up from the back, walked down that aisle, and we laid our hands and began to pray on, for her. And she fell out in the spirit. Don't be alarmed when somebody falls in the spirit. God's doing an operation. And when she came back to mind, she looked up and she said, Brother Norris, I'm healed. He said, what was the problem? She said, I was tone deaf. I was completely deaf in my right ear. But God opened up. Can I confess? <laughs> I'm going to confess to you that all at once I felt like running into the hall and say, Lord, what about me? What I'm trying to convey to you this morning is that for God so loves the world that he wants his church not to condemn the sinner, but to love the sinner, go after the sinner, recruit the sinner. So, as I mentioned to you, you don't know who walks through your double doors. They could be suffering so deeply, ready to end it all. <coughs> you don't know that because they hide it from you. Individuals that are in that kind of a condition generally hide it from everybody. They don't want the people to know that they're, they're not givers. So let me share this. I was pastoring a wonderful church when I was in my younger years. West Virginia, it gets really cold there at times. And one morning, it was about four degrees below zero. And I expected maybe the church to be scarcely attended that morning. But when I got there, the church was packed as general. People standing around the walls because we were getting ready to build a new church to, to be able to hold the people that church experienced so many miracles that the people wouldn't even go on vacation for fear they would miss one. <laughs> so all at once, in that frigid weather, I got up to preach my message after the devotion. And suddenly the doors opened and a gust of frigid air came in and just almost filled the church. It was so cold. She was scantily dressed. Anyone would probably have realized her profession. She did, Brother Williams, she did not come in to hear me preach. She come to get warm. And she sat down on the back row where there was a seat that was ready for her. And I saw some of my precious people get up and move. And I changed my message. <laughs> I started preaching, for God so loved the world. He does not condemn what you are. He only condemns what you're doing. And several times I made eye contact with her 
as I expressed how tremendous the love of God can transform our lives. And when I concluded my message, I went like that as I locked eyes with her. She came running to the altar. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. That church never remembered that she was a prostitute. She was that lovely saint of God that developed in the open door church as a product of God's transformation. I want to close or come to a close with this. There was a woman came to the Lord understanding that he was at meet with Simon the leper. I've often wondered, Brother Betcher, if that had not been the Simon the leper that met Jesus in the eighth chapter of the book of, of Matthew. When he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And the Lord stretched his hand to an already ex-leper because it was against the law for to touch a leper. Jesus reached his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. And I wondered if Simon was not that leper. I'd like to think he was. There was a woman came in with an alabaster box of ointment, the price of which probably was her entire livelihood. It was for her death. It was for anointing when she would be deceased. That was the custom of the time. But she came in with that ointment in her hands and she began to weep profusely and she began to bathe the feet of Jesus with the tears and she took the strands of her hair and wiped the tears from those feet in her love for what he had done for her because Jesus let me know through the scripture that she had been a terrible sinner. The Bible said she was. But now she's given thanksgiving to the Lord for the transformation that she had made. Simon the leper. No longer leprous. Began to condemn the woman in his mind. And said, if this man was a prophet, he would know that she's a sinner. So, Jesus gives Simon a lesson. He said, when I walked into this place, you did not give me a basin to wash my feet. You did not anoint me. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman has not ceased to cry and wash my feet and kiss my feet ceaselessly. And then suddenly, all at once, she responded. She could have taken the cap off of that ointment and allow the perfume and the fragrance to fill the room. But she did not. Out of the appreciation of what Jesus Christ had done in her life. She broke the box and let the contents flow over him. She anointed his body for a burial. Do you love Jesus enough this morning to express your love for him, for what he has done for you? Have you been healed of any kind of a sickness and knowing that it was through the blood of Jesus Christ being shed on Calvary that you are now whole? I'm going to say something that most of you know already. 
Do you remember when I was preaching up here one time? I did not know that I had a cancer growing in my groin. I did not know. And I was preaching and suddenly I began to faint in the spirit. Brother Williams, you caught me. I did not know. But you prayed for me. You anointed me and prayed for me. I didn't know I had a cancer. But I went to the doctor and he showed me the cancer that I was suffering from that was sapping my strength. Look at me today. Your prayers. The love. The love of this church for me. He brought me a chair and I sat down here and completed my message. Not knowing what I was suffering from. But when I saw that cancer in the scanning. You know what? I visited the oncologist about six months later, and he said, you don't have to come back anymore. There's nothing there. <laughs> Would you hear, let me say my, my last phrases to you today? Jesus' love for humanity is beyond amazing. He loves you so much as an individual. I am not talking to a congregation this morning. I'm separating each of you into an individual. And I'm telling you, do you remember your condition? Now, El amor de Dios extiende más allá del asombro. Far beyond amazing, you will find the love of God searching for each of you. And what I'm going to conclude with this morning, and I have not even touched really a lot of my message today, but my time has got ahead of me. And I'm going to tell you, if you're not surrendered to Jesus Christ, his love is available to you at this moment. If you are discouraged, he is the encourager. If you have a situation in your life that you need victory over, if you will surrender your life to Jesus Christ, even this morning in this altar, God will take care of that situation for you. If I'm talking to you, why don't you break out of that seat and come and allow God to move into your life? Just give him a chance today. He's already reaching. He started to break up the ground during worship. Some received what they needed, but not everyone. Some he simply softened the ground. Come on, let's respond to him right now. Put away put away our resistance as he dismantled the wall between us. Jesus, you have done a masterful job today removing brick by brick, stone by stone. The things that we've put in place that stand between us. Now that it's removed, God, 
Don't let me rebuild it right now, but let me open my heart to you. Reach in and heal. Reach in and fill, God. Restore. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. God, help me trust the flow of your spirit through my life again right now. Just begin to worship him right now. What do you need? If you don't know, why don't you ask him? Ask him, Lord, what am I missing, God? I believe, but help thou my unbelief. I've done all of that stuff, but what lack I yet came the words from the scripture. Something's not right, God, but I don't know what it is. What am I lacking? Why don't you ask him this morning? What's missing, God? What's missing? Fill it right now, God. Fill it, Lord, right now.